speaker is Andrew Lichterman, who is a, an attorney, a longtime anti-nuclear activist, and on the board of Western States Legal Foundation. Please welcome Andrew. So the first part of my assignment from Phil is to uh, provide you with a little bit of uh, an overview of what we can tell about what's happening at Fukushima. And that's one of the most important things is we, we really don't know. And it's by no means over. You know, we can sort of try to derive a kind of least common denominator from the government and industry statements and, and piece it together. But that's really the best that we can do. Um, and compared to Chernobyl, this remains a problem even in a uh, relatively more open society like Japan in the midst of a broader disaster that has brought uh, global scrutiny to bear on, on Japan on this particular uh, disaster. So um, there are six reactors at the Fukushima plant. Two of the six uh, appear to be in relatively uh, safe shutdown modes with operating cooling systems. Uh, those have fuel in their cores and consequently still have to be cooled. They also have spent fuel ponds with significant quantities of spent fuel. Um, these pools also require constant cooling. Um, these two were not operating at the time of the accident. Three additional reactors were fueled and operating at the time of the earthquake and the tsunami. Um, all three have had serious accidents, with the consensus apparently being that there has been substantial melting of the reactor fuel in all three instances. Now, these accidents were caused by a loss of electrical power to the cooling systems and not by the impact of the earthquake uh, itself. Um, the reactors apparently, although they don't really know this yet from, from what you can tell from public information, um, shut down successfully after the earthquake. Backup diesel generators then kicked in, but those stopped operating for a variety of reasons after the tsunami hit and could not be restarted. Backup batteries then kicked in, but they can only provide a limited number of hours uh, eight hours, I believe it was, of, of continued uh, electrical power. And after that, the reactors began to heat up and um, until they could provide additional cooling, which they still really have not done entirely successfully, uh, a, a meltdown was inevitable. Now, all three of the reactors that were operating also have suffered hydrogen explosions. The containment of one and possibly uh, two of the reactors likely has been breached. In one reactor, U.S. analysts believe that some of the molten reactor fuel has left the reactor vessel and reached the uh, containment floor uh, outside, although uh, industry officials in Japan contest this. In another reactor, uh, the fuel is, and possibly in, in, in all three, the fuel is believed to have uh, melted sufficiently that it's difficult to achieve water circulation uh, adequate for cooling. Uh, cooling problems at all three reactors also appear to be exacerbated by the buildup of salt from the evaporation of large quantities of seawater used for emergency cooling in the weeks after the accident when this was the only option available. Uh, very large quantities of radioactive materials were vented from the three reactors to the atmosphere, partly because the operators did so intentionally to reduce pressure within the containment uh, and to avoid even larger releases, um, and possibly um, because one or more of the containments themselves may have been breached. Now, the spent fuel pools at the three reactors that were operating and at a fourth that was not pose additional dangers. They're high up in the reactor buildings and not inside the primary containments of the reactors. Um, explosions, ex explosions in the reactors and in one of the fuel pools uh, basically has exposed um, these to the outside air. 
in one case, they actually vented um, the remaining uh, reactor structure to, to prevent further hydrogen explosions. Now, the fourth reactor was not fueled. However, because the fuel had been removed relatively recently and is um, thus relatively hot, very hot, and now we're, we're not talking radioactivity, we're talking thermally hot, um, it posed particular problems for cooling, and there was a hydrogen explosion and possibly a fuel fire in that spent fuel pool, which may also be a significant source of the releases of radioactive materials. Um, and again, this fuel pool poses particular dangers, but all of them have to be continually cooled. And currently, cooling for all of these reactors and fuel pools is being accomplished to the extent possible by various measures that are pretty much short-term and ad hoc. And the barriers to uh, uh, basically establishing more permanent cooling measures, to restoring any kind of, of uh, cooling as, as would be uh, there in normal operations, are just immense. Uh, emergency measures, again, such as using seawater for cooling, have caused a variety of new problems, which they can't even get in to really examine because the facilities are so radioactive. Um, there are fears that flooding of the containment vessels um, for cooling as they go on um, may also make them more vulnerable to aftershocks. And as was noted earlier, there was a quite large 7-plus aftershock uh, yesterday. Um, now, total releases of radioactive cesium and iodine, which are the ones that we are getting figures for, that doesn't mean other things aren't getting out, now are approaching a significant fraction of the amounts released in Chernobyl. And this is reported amounts. Again, I would stress um, we don't really uh, know what the totals are. Um, and there are some differences. In terms of the Chernobyl releases, you had a very, very large explosion, much larger than the hydrogen explosions that you had at Fukushima, at Chernobyl, and you had a very long burning, very hot fire. All of this managed to mobilize a lot of material um, much higher up into the atmosphere, uh, most likely allowing it to be transported longer distances. It was also basically smack in the middle of um, uh, Russia and Europe, and so you, d you didn't have so much being transported out over the ocean. But nonetheless, we are talking about very significant releases, and it's not over. It is continuing. You also have water with very high levels of radioactive materials uh, leaking into the sea. Um, radioactive iodine and cesium has been detected at millions of times the legal limits. Um, and they're dumping water with lower but still significant concentrations of radioactive materials into the ocean in order to make space for the really bad stuff that they have flooding all of their engineering spaces so that they hope they may manage to get in and, and do the work that they need to, to do. Um, there's been highly radioactive fish caught in the area. In general, it is a a environmental and human catastrophe of the first magnitude. And the potential for further um, disastrous deterioration, unfortunately, uh, remains significant. Um, the, the situation at the plant appears, from what we can glean, to be continuing to deteriorate in some ways. You have um, more radioactive releases because they are, are ongoing, making it more difficult for people to work on the site. Um, and again, as noted, and there was this, this interesting uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, internal report that was leaked to the New York Times and then was posted various places on the internet um, that, that basically raised these, these problems that are the consequences of the remedial measures, for example, the, the flooding making the containments more vulnerable to, to further seismic shocks. Um, and Throughout this, um, TEPCO, which is the Tokyo Electric, the Japanese government and international authorities have told um, pretty consistently less than what they knew in public statements um, about what was going on. Now, to be sure, you have the problem that it is inherently difficult to know what's going on at these plants after a serious accident of this kind. 
Again, you can't gain physical access to much of the plant. Much of your instrumentation has been destroyed, right? But nonetheless, um, the information itself has kind of been leaking out in dribs and drabs, and you have specific instances of uh, estimates that are being made uh, not being shared with the public. You had estimates uh, and modeling by the uh, Japanese Meteorological Agency that was uh, not released for a long time until it was released due to public pressure. Uh, and you have this very interesting process going on that I'm not really sure of, of the full meaning of, where you have um, leaks to the New York Times from the NRC, which are clearly, I think, some kind of you know, trying to put pressure on the Japanese government, but I'm not sure what. And one of the things that was very interesting was the disparity between the early U.S. government statements and the measures that they took to protect their own military personnel and other personnel quite early on uh, after this event. Um, so, you know, again, and this has been touched on by several of the other speakers, um, nuclear accidents have some distinctive characteristics in terms of the information you're going to be able to get. Um, virtually all of the information is contestable from the outset for some of the reasons I've just mentioned. Much of it, again, is accessible only indirectly um, and requires combinations of remote instruments and expert calculation. Uh, physical effects may be very considerable, big explosions, fires, and so forth, but even these take place at facilities that are often very tightly controlled. In the case of Chernobyl, it was many days before uh, the rest of the world got a sense of what was going on. Um, uh, and again, if, if the containment remains at all intact, um, you're not going to be able to get in there and, and look at what's going on. You know, if you, if you look, you read this NRC report, they're trying to induce what's going on by, you know, what they can tell from what instrumentation they have left after a lot of it has been damaged. Um, now, a second problem is that radioactive materials can be present in quantity sufficient to cause very significant health and environmental impacts, and yet it's invisible, and it can travel very great distances. Um, and it requires sophisticated instruments to detect, analyze sufficiently, and generally a pretty broad monitoring and modeling effort to get a, a real picture um, of where the radioactive materials are going and what their impact might be. And um, so just about all of this is going to be in the control of governments, um, industry, uh, and you know, other large organizations that may not be inclined to share it with the public. Um, and again, you can figure out quite a bit by remote mo uh, monitoring. A lot of the information that has come out, the estimates that have come out, have come from uh, data that's come from the world network that was uh, deployed to detect very, very small quantities of radionuclides um, to detect possible uh, uh, nuclear testing the Comprehensive Test Ban Organization Network. Um, but once again, this is something that is very susceptible to government and industry capture. You have to have a big institution to deploy this kind of stuff. And there's a real paucity of genuinely independent, well-funded, effective um, nuclear expertise. And what there is is always subject to concerted and well-funded campaigns to discredit whatever they have to say, both in particular accidents and um, in general. How am I doing for time, Phil? How much I got? I have five minutes. Oh, my Lord. All right, well, let's skip through some stuff here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, nuclear power and nuclear weapons, um, materially, politically, and ideologically. Um, this relationship has resulted in very significant um, economic subsidies, some of them explicit, some of them structural to nuclear power, and has also concentrated nuclear expertise in secretive institutions driven by military concerns. And this really has affected the evaluation of the health and environmental effects of uh, radioactive materials from very early on in the nuclear age. Uh, Carl Morgan, one of the founders of the health physics discipline, um, put it this way. He said that government health physicists are expected to develop safe means to dispose of radioactive waste 
and to set limits of maximum permissible body burden and acceptable concentrations in air, water, and food for hundreds of new species of isotopes. All of this was to be done in a way that would prevent radiation industries so far as humanly possible. At the same time, however, we understand that the atomic bomb pro program could not be impeded. It was like being thrown into a cage of lions and instructed not to injure them because they were being trained to destroy the enemy. And this atmosphere persisted um, well into and likely throughout the Cold War period, playing a role in the acceptance of nuclear power initially, which in turn has created another large, powerful set of institutions with a vested interest in maintaining um, it in minimizing the adverse health and environmental effects of radiation. And certainly we can see, as, as again several of the previous speakers have pointed out, that this ideological battle over nuclear energy and over the effects of radiation um, is fully on display in, in the response that you have seen to this Fukushima accident. And, you know, you get the, the, the classic tactics. You know, first of all, there's just the straight out, oh well, um, these big dispersed doses to large populations um, have no discernible, you know, no, there's, there's no danger to human health in the environment. They just Xerox that, I think, on the bottoms of the press releases, okay, where you have these big, well, you know, that's not even accepted mainstream uh, science anymore. The, the general mainstream position is that there is no uh, safe level of additional radiation. Um, it may be dispersed ab across populations, but with a given dose, you are going to get a, a given uh, increase in risk. And then when the, the risk gets to the point of being uh, undeniable, and I think this was pointed out before too, they get the, oh well, there's no immediate health effects. You're not going to drop dead right now, but who knows what's going to happen to you in 20 or 30 years. The position was, what we are measuring now will not give you effect. Yeah. Uh, what about what you are not measuring? Yeah. This was the source. Yes, the very good what you are measuring now. Yeah, absolutely, what we are measuring now. Mm -hmm. um, and just a, a, a note about the plants here in the United States. You have 104 reactors around the United States. You have um, uh, 31 of them are designs that are fairly similar to the, the Fukushima uh, reactors. You have pretty similar strategies for responding to accidents, the same kind of de defense and death, stra death strategies, but also similar vulnerabilities to a station blackout, to losing all of your electric power um, in an accident. Uh, here in California, we have uh, four reactors, two down at Diablo Canyon, two at San Onofre. Uh, Diablo Canyon is currently in, in relicensing review. San Onofre is expected to follow soon. These are um, a, a different reactor design, but nonetheless, they're also in an earthquake zone. Uh, you have the same kind of battle going on over uh, Diablo Canyon, where you have a design-based earthquake being assumed to be the largest one that could possibly happen, and yet they've discovered additional faults offshore. and. Uh, earthquake science is also a pretty new science, and if you ask people who work in that field, they'll, you know, freely admit that they can't really tell you what the maximum predictable earthquake is in a lot of these, these regions. So, um, to close, I'd like to, to just uh, meditate a little on, on the experts who uh, seem to, to dominate the discussion in all of these contexts. Now, I'll, I'll go to a physicist. In, in 1930, Nobel Prize winning physicist Robert Millikan wrote that, quotes, one may sleep in peace with the consciousness that the creator has put some foolproof elements into his handiwork and that man is powerless to do it any titanic damage. Now, obviously this has been proven false by, not only by nuclear weapons and by nuclear power, but by the devastating ecological effects of the endless accumulation of wealth for its own sake, and by the growing ability of human beings to manipulate the most basic building blocks of the natural world itself. 
And all of these issues really are manifestations of a global society in which most resources and most of the earth itself is controlled by a tiny minority with choices which affect all of us dressed up as natural and necessary by experts who mainly work in their service. And a common theme in all of these uh, preventable disasters is that key deci decisions are made at a great remove both socially and geographically from the places where the human and ecological impacts are likely to be felt. And ironically, in a society uh, where science is looked to for the solution for most of our problems, we are suffering from a separation of cause and effect. So our challenge really is to build the kind of social movements that can bring about the changes so we can give real decision-making power and real voice to all of those who are affected by the decisions of huge organizations that are justified by experts and by doing so that we can democratize the economy and with it our decisions about technology choice. Great.